Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. On the show today, I look forward to this weekend's MotoGP action in France and Keith's live from the Northwest 200 with a very special guest. And a heads up, uh, there is a few technical issues with that. Sound quality dips in and out, but hopefully you'll really enjoy our little chat, which happens later on in the show. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, Get in touch in the meantime in all the usual ways. Crash MotoGP on the socials. Send us a, a question. Email it to podcast at crash.net. The recording date is Tuesday, the 9th of May. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me as ever is Crash MotoGP editor Pete McLaren and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewin. Uh, now. Oh, and, and you forward- forgot one. And what North did I forget? West, Northwest 200 winner as a newcomer and lap record holder for here. Oh, it's a bit, bit of a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the mouthful that I love. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, Keith in his element at the moment uh, in Northern Ireland. But uh, before we come on to uh, our little uh, Northwest 200 chat, why don't we have a look forward to this weekend? We're back in Le Mans, aren't we? Um, and Pete, I actually want to come to you first, if I may, because uh, let's just pin down the riders that are in the riders that are out <laughs> and what's going on with Mark Marquez. So the, the riders in and out. So as we know, Bastianini tried to come back at Jerez. He he abandoned that. He's missing this weekend's race. There's, there's a bit of a break after it. So he's obviously deciding give the shoulder a, a, a bit more longer to recover. And then it'll be Mugello actually will be the next one. So it'll be a home race to come back. And in comes Danilo Petrucci. So that'll be a very popular move. Petrucci returning to the team with which he won this Le Mans race with in 2020 in the wet. So uh, we saw him, didn't we, last year at uh, Bury Rum on the Suzuki. That was the first time he'd been back since he he left MotoGP as a full-time rider at the end of 21. Then he did the Dakar, didn't he? Moto America, everything. Now he's in World Superbike and he's jumping across with Ducati. So he's, it's an easier move now. He can jump across and he's back in MotoGP. Uh, Paul Despargaru is still out. As we say, he's had those nasty injuries at round one. So Jonas Volker is still replacing him, the test rider. Um, then Mark Marquez was still waiting on an official decision on whether he's back or not from this thumb injury. But we have had an official announcement on his penalty that he got at round one, which has now officially been annulled, to use the uh, the terminology. Um, and so, yes, he won't. It, it, uh, it's he won't need to do the long laps when he comes back. Basically, that's what it means. Um, as Keith was just saying to us off air, it's a bit of the worst case se- worst, worst kept secret, really, isn't it? I mean, we all thought. Yeah, you know, when that wording was changed, it's, you know, when Honda yeah, don't you know appeal things that, yeah, they, were wait, they were waiting for Russia to invade somewhere else so they could lose the news <laughs> under under the scene somewhere. It was just ridiculous. I mean, it should have been bloody announced, you know, two minutes after it all happened because legal, legally wise, it was never going to stand up. Great news for us, though, at least, was that it, it, it was announced while we were recording a podcast. So <laughs> That's only because I had so many technical issues. We had plenty of time to wait for it. <laughs> 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 we absolutely did. Um, oh well, that's at least that's something, Pete, though, isn't it? But I that mean, is, yeah, sorry, I Miguel think, Oliveira, I yeah, can't just, imagine yeah, will be too pleased with that. Still more, isn't there? On the yeah, so Miguel yeah. Oliveira is now out again for the second time this year with the shoulder dislocation. In comes Lorenzo Savadori, the Aprilia test rider who we spoke about road for RNF at the Jerez test recently. So we got a bit of time with the team on the last year's bike. Um, and and Ralph Fernandez is going to his teammate is going to try and come back. He had arm sur- arm pump surgery again. We sort of. We knew that was probably going to happen. He's had it now, but he needs to pass a medical. He hopes to ride, but again, he's going to have to pass a medical on Thursday. So, yeah, there's still still a lot of walking wounded in MotoGP at the moment. Well, as we look forward to this weekend then, uh, Keith, what what can we expect for Le Mans? What's catching your eye? Well, it will be a riot to start with, like it always is at Le Mans. Le Mans is the, you know, like Argentina, which feels like a blast back to the 1980s. This place is exactly the same. Everywhere's a you know, there's hooligans everywhere, campsites all fire, all you can smell is burning wood or burning houses um, for the entire week you're out there. The French really are a bunch, there's no doubt about it. They, they, I think they practice burning things at Le Mans before they move on to some other, some other political cause somewhere. Um, but it's a great, it's a, it's not a racetrack that's very enjoyable from a rider perspective, I don't think. There are a couple of corners on there that you can say get your, get your attention, but I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a very interesting racetrack, but it always produces a shock. You know, it's the kind of place that you, you can turn up suddenly something that you weren't expecting. Um, and for some strange reason, the Brits always did quite well there. I mean, I'm still waiting for bloody uh, our man to win his first race after he chucked it away out there, Jake, Jake Dixon. I mean, he was on for winning that Moto2 race. And uh, 
and this might be the one that he wins. Who knows? Let's hope it is. Well, if you keep bringing it up, it might not be. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, it's one of those situations where I think Jake's uh, a bit better than my comments. Let's put it that way. I think mm-hmm. that he is a, a, a race winner still in waiting in the wings. Um, but we'll have to see. I mean, it's not a favourite, I don't think, from from my perspective. Le Mans is a nice town. It's a nice place to go to. You know, there's plenty of places to go and eat. It's got a nice big square there. Um, it's it's you know, it's a it's a good place to be. Um, but the, the, the atmosphere of the racetrack is just wild. Well, I don't know what on earth they're on when they're there, but it is literally. And, it, and if a Frenchman can do any good there, then there will be a, a riot. Um, and now that we've, 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 we've gone through the, the Brexit situation as well, they're not very good if you've got a GB sticker on your car. <laughs> 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 and they never have been. That's not. That's not. That's not recent. They don't, yeah, um, that's that's forever. The French and the English have always um, had a, had a little bit of competition there. So it can get a bit hectic if you're if you're in the tunnel trying to get under the track and there's a traffic jam and they've got your GB stickers and you're on the you're on the wrong Take side of off. the car. I've had them wheel my car from 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 the, the 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 walkway is higher than the cars. So you're likely to end up with any detritus that's left at the end of the race day over the top of your car. Yeah, that wasn't was... be- that wasn't because you were British though. That was just because you keep you. <laughs> <Was it? Yeah. laughs> well, I'd like to think not, but it might have been a combination. <laughs> well, look, we've had um, we've got a time for a couple of questions that have come in off the, off the back of uh, our last race in Hereth, and, and again now as we look forward to uh, Le Mans. Uh, this one is from Hardy. Let's have a listen. Hello, gents. I'm Hardy from Scotland. I have a question relating to the situation at Yamaha. I'm wondering how much, if any blame can be placed on the riders for the less than ideal state of the bike. Fabio largely overruled the likes of Dovi on the direction for the bike's development and ultimately got what he wanted, more horsepower, whilst Franco has been poor for so long that his data and insight is almost certainly less useful as a result. Are Franco and Fabio learning a tough lesson on how difficult it is to develop a bike? Thanks guys, love the pod. So now all that we get some bloody good questions, don't we? Because that is a really smart question. There's no mm-hmm. doubt in my mind about that. And it is a collaboration between rider and team and engineer and factory. And I think if we go to the Gigi Delinia situation, Ducati had an okay motorbike that was massively faster than everything else that still couldn't win a championship until he came together and coordinated the rider, the team, and the factory, it seemed to me. There, there seemed to be three separate elements in that situation back in the day. Yeah, okay, they got Casey Stoner, who could ride it, and that was the reason why. But no one else could do what they're doing. I mean, Honda may have a similar situation. It's only Marquez who can ride it, and maybe that's because the collaboration between the, the three main elements isn't there. So I think the question is valid. Um, Quattararo, did he have the experience to to develop a motorcycle, or did he just jump on a motorbike that was actually renowned as being the easiest bike to ride, and he found it absolutely to his liking, the default when he got to that bike at that time in his career, and at that time in time, it was a bike that he could ride to the to the to the to where it was to and put it where he did. But now that it's moved on a bit and they need a bit more, then they're not able to develop it in the way that it needs to be done. Um, Morbidelli had that injury for a long time, and that really wiped out any any input that he had. So I think that yes, the riders do have some responsibility. In short, to your question, I think it's broader than that, but I think that the linkage between rider, engineers, and factory are the things that are have to be a cohesive cohesive group of people working together with one goal and you wonder whether because there aren't enough Yamaha riders on the track otherwise there's only really been two the data they're receiving the data they're trying to disseminate just isn't enough to move them forward um Suzuki did it brilliantly you know Ken Kowalchi has moved across as well so you know, one of their top technicians is, is moving around. You know, we've had some very good guys that have gone from Suzuki to other factories now, which have benefited other factories. Ducati have, have, have crossed that bridge to make their motorbike work everywhere. KTM have, have, have got it sorted now. It's incredible what they've achieved in, in this winter period. Aprilia have done it as well. It's amazing that, that you've, you've got Yamaha that are being left behind, Suzuki that have had to leave completely. On the Honda... What are they on the cusp of? A black hole, it almost seems to me at the moment. Honda, it just doesn't seem that even with more bikes on the track, that they can move it forward just yet. Um, there must be a lot of people scratching their heads, but riders do have to take a responsibility as well. 
But if they don't have the experience, like Cotteraro perhaps didn't have really, he became, he was a, a two times Moto 2 winner, or one time if you take it officially, because the other one were took away from him. But, you know, he was a, you know, the experience, an unex, inexperienced Moto 2 rider that came into Moto GP and lucked out that the bike worked for him and performed in a way that his style worked with. Now, from that point onwards, developing something is a whole different game. It's a tricky one, isn't it? As you say, Keith, you, you think, well, that, they must obviously share some responsibility for it. I mean, I guess if you're Quattararo, and I think he, he raised this at a res, he'd say, well, you know, if you look at the Yamaha, it looks visibly very similar to three or four years ago. You look at the Ducati or the Aprilia, they look completely different. And and so, you know, that's again, the aero and, and things like that coming into play. And I mean, Quattararo, I guess as a rider, you've got to be clear, haven't you, about what you want. And I would say that he, certainly this year, he's very clear about where the problems of the bike are. You know, he's trying to emphasize that, yes, they've got more power, but it's not enough. And they're still having to run the small wings. So he's saying that actually the engine power is not even now anywhere near what it needs to be because they're having to go with those small wings. They have much bigger aerodynamics available. Cal was testing them. Um, both riders had them in test in, in winter testing as well. And then they suddenly went back to last year's because they couldn't get the speed and everything else working. But going back to old parts in this in this era of MotoGP, I mean, it's only going to be a very small stopgap fix, isn't it? You've got to come up with new stuff. And, and that's where I think you would say, if you looked at the Yamaha, there's not lots of things being thrown at it, like we saw KTM at the test at Jerez. You know, all these different parts coming into play. That doesn't seem to be happening at Yamaha. And, uh, you know, Quattro is clear about what he needs. You know, the bike needs to qualify and he's struggling in the race situations. Maybe Suzuki saw the writing on the wall for a cross-plane four-cylinder motorcycle. Maybe the situation was they were topped out on their development, where they could go, and they knew that they had to go V4 style or something along those lines to get to get the kind of power, the type of power that everybody else had. And maybe that's why Suzuki pulled the plug, even though they'd signed over another five years and all the rest of it with, with MotoGP. They just got to that position. There would have been other business reasons, I'm sure, behind it, but on reflection, perhaps... That was an element of their decision to pull out because they were at the end of their development with that style of, of, of power package. And maybe Yamaha are there as well. You know, you're forcing them in a cross plane. It's a fast motorcycle on its own. You know, like if Quattararo, if he can run his lines, he, he's able to, to use what he's got. But you can't do that in a, in a situation where everyone else's style and performance is, is putting it down in a different place on, on the track. And that just mucks up Quattro or whoever's riding the bike. It will mess their corner speed up in one way or another. So maybe Yamaha, and again, this is what worries me about whether we will be in a situation where we'll lose someone like Yamaha to the series, in that the investment in changing their philosophy of powertrain is huge. And it goes against their marketing, perhaps, of what they've got going on in the in the road bike scenario. You know, I'm at the Northwest 200 where it's a road track with road, you know, road-based motorcycles racing around here. And they're doing, you know, today from a standing style, Alice to see the 205 miles an hour through the speed trap, you know, on what is a modified road bike, effectively. You know, the, the super stock class are all just clicking 199 mile an hour through the speed trap here. I know it's fast, but, you know, and actually, they're dinosaurs. You know, is that the trajectory that marketing of motorcycles is going in? I don't think it is. Super bikes are... Their sales are, are stagnant completely. Super sports bikes are, are going quite well at the moment. Off-road stuff is going well at the moment. You know, the development platforms, are they as relevant as they once were? It's a question, not a statement. I mean, I I just think to myself sometimes that, that maybe Suzuki saw where their future lie and dived out of the, of the game. Will Yamaha do the same? taking that a little bit further Keith and, and I think that's a very good point and I haven't really thought about it but maybe then with the rules that are coming up in the future should there be different slightly different technical rules for inline four cylinders for in the same way that we have different rules for different numbers of cylinders just to try and keep that variety there maybe that's something that that needs to be to be thought about I don't know and one more thing on the Yamaha uh, maybe they they should have used Morbidelli a bit like Ducati used Pramac you know maybe Morbidelli should have kept the big aero just so they were gathering data on it in all these rounds. I mean, okay, it might not have been ideal for Morbidelli, but I mean, they they felt that that was obviously going to be their new aero for this year. Maybe with hindsight, they, they could have gone, look, Franco, 
we want you to run this aero. Fabio, want, he likes the old one, but we really want you to run this. You can get all the data on it. And we've got two different bikes then, whereas now they've only got data on last year's aero. They're going to have to introduce new aero at some stage, but it's going to be a big gamble, isn't it? You've got no testing now until Mizano in, well, in September. Let me expand that out then, Pete, because I think you're bang on dead right there. I think that's a really good, you know, travel, direction of travel. Alter the concessions package. So the manufacturers that are, that are yeah. obviously clearly in trouble give them some concessions so they can test extra stuff. And I think that's where Yamaha's at. The, the, the testing issue has been an issue, is an issue. But also it's the financial issue. The amount of money now being spent and the amount of commitment that each of these teams has to have is, is huge. We've covered it so many times in podcasts before. But I think the concessions could be expanded. It costs really nothing. And, and they can try stuff, you know, around the races perhaps you know book a test day the day after or something like that on a racetrack that's relevant you know without going somewhere across the other side of the world when the weather conditions are different to anything that they're going to be seeing when you when you're back to back testing the next day of the, the, with your test riders or with your main riders that's the issue i think with yamaha they want to they should really test with their main race riders and they need concessions to be able to do that so maybe there's a, a position where within the new package when it comes that concessions can be modified a little bit and fine tune yeah, well, great question, uh, Hardy. Thank you very much for sending that one in. Uh, just enough time. We'll get one more in uh, from one Japanese manufacturer to another. It's uh, it's our friend Dean. Hi, guys. It's Dean from Essex. Hope everyone's well. Um, my question today is about Alex Rins. And what do you think about Alex Rins getting a recent slap on the wrist by Honda and a warning um, for speaking negatively about Honda and the fact they're not utilising him as a test rider as he was not able to test the Calex chassis of uh, Stefan Bradl's bike and also yeah going forwards from that um, tell me what you think guys let me know your thoughts uh, have a great day yeah he's up that's what I like to hear a little bit of um, as you like um, <laughs> do you know what it's very frustrating when you're, when you're a rider on the up Rins is Rins is, is there or thereabouts at the moment I mean and, and you do get frustrated and you can't always homogenize or whatever the word would be your speech and your, your you know and there's you know 50 journos pete included hanging around behind the trucks trying to get the odd scoop and if you get a rider in the right mood at the or the wrong mood at the right time or the right mood at the wrong time then you get a result and i mean i used to hang around like a you know naughty little boy in the mornings at sort of half past six at a racetrack in the car park on the way into a track because Everybody has to come past you, you know, all the, all the riders, all the teams, all the techs, and you just hang around, you know, block past them in your hire car on the way in and then apologize profusely and strike up a conversation with whoever you like and, um, and get information. And somebody's obviously got him at a point where he's not been in the best of moods. Um, and I don't blame him. You know, he should have been used as a right, you know, he's a guy on the up, he's doing the business at the minute, he, you know. But Honda, we talked about Yamaha a moment ago being ones that could withdraw from, from the series. You know, Honda at the moment must be thinking, what have we got to do? Now, this has been an ongoing situation since the electronics package was changed. Honda had a, an electronics package, you know, the ECU and the inertial platform that really controlled their bike really, really well. It was very advanced. And we went back to the Magnani Morelli system for everybody. And it didn't really work for Honda. They were all at sea. And it didn't really work for Yamaha, actually, when I think about it. About times Colin Edwards used to bleat about the fact that he was never quite as good as he was before. Um, although Alasia at that time got on with it okay. You know, it was a situation where Honda, Honda's philosophy has to change slightly. And I think it is in the fact that they are trying a different chassis. Um, maybe they just didn't have the capacity to be able to try it. And the fact that testing was restricted to the amount it was restricted to meant that they haven't been able to get a fair bite of the cherry. Was it any better? To be honest, I don't think anybody really knew. You know, if you jumped on a bike, you wouldn't you wouldn't find the immediate advantages in something until you'd gone through the full schedule of, of of changing other things. You put a new chassis on it, that doesn't naturally fix something. Because by then you've got to dial in the suspension at the rear, suspension at the front, the ride eye adjustment, you know, everything, you know, even the way that the, the, the thing accelerates and decelerates. You've got to dial all that in to suit the chassis. You can't do that in one day. That's weeks of work. You know, 
what did um, Jeremy Burgess used to call it on the MR? What was it? The MR team, maybe I can't remember. That used to say that it was the the, the blunderbuss or the shotgun bloody uh, cure, where they used to <laughs> fire everything at it all in one yeah. go. Just sometimes that's a real last gasp effort to make it work, and it hasn't, and it won't. We are in we're in an era of thousands of seconds to the to to the third decimal point. And I've argued often that we need the fourth decimal point now because sometimes we get two or three teams on a whole lap with different manufacturers that are on exactly the same time. We're in a different era. Things are minuscule, the advantages that people find. And just chucking, you know, this at it and that, it doesn't work really. You need the time, the progress to, to work it through. Maybe on the need concessions as well. I can't, can't believe I'm saying that. Maybe the, like Yamaha, on the needs concessions as well. I mean, as much as I'm waving the flag for the good old EU, doing brilliantly. I'm not, by the way, but anyway. Um, the, the European manufacturers are doing so well compared with the Japanese. But these things have a shift, don't they? I mean, the, the, the Europeans have been fighting to get back to where they are, and the Jap Japanese have been a little bit... Well, have they been slightly lazy, perhaps? Not treated it with the amount of effort they should have done? I mean, you got Alex Rins coming in. Uh, they say Jerez was a bad round for him anyway, so I'm sure he wasn't in a perfect move. But then also, he's coming from there, isn't he? He's just won in Cota. But also, he's coming into Honda, having been a factory rider for all of his MotoGP career, and now he's in a satellite team. And maybe he's realising what it's like to be in a satellite team, which is, okay, you can have a factory contract, which he's got. You can have the latest bike, a 2023 bike, which he's got. But there's always going to be that that order, that hierarchy, isn't there, of, of who gets the new parts first. And the thing with the, the Cali chassis, I, was, I think Rins, he said to us in English, obviously the, the riders speak, if they're, Rins is case Spanish, he will speak to Spanish media and he'll speak then again to us in English. So sometimes they say slightly different things. But he did bring up that he was surprised that he didn't get to try it. But, I mean, Bradle, as we spoke about, he threw it down the road. It was, it, it was a big accident that he had on that Calix. They rushed to rebuild it. Mia took it out then and, and I think he didn't even do one lap and, and the bike broke down because of an electrical, pro electrical problem probably related to all the, the accident before and things like that. So, I mean, that, that accident put the whole schedule behind anyway. Whether whether Rins was due to test it, I honestly don't know. But I think, you know, given that Mia, he didn't get to test it either, really. I mean, you can't judge anything from an outlap. So really, he's no worse off than the other Honda riders. But I think there is a bit of frustration there that, yeah, maybe he's realizing what life is like as a, a satellite rider. And, you know, fair enough, he has, you know, he broke Honda's wind right. And maybe he thinks, come on, guys, you know, Mark's still out and, and wants a bit more support. But we know that the Japanese teams, they don't tend to switch support that quickly between their riders, you know, in satellite teams and things. We've seen the Europeans, they are quite open. If you bring the results, we'll bring you the parts kind of thing. The Japanese are much more sort of, well, this is the situation. This is the factory team and this is the satellite team. And I think those, those things are coming into play there. Well, thank you, Dean. For that question. Um, now, we uh, mentioned that Keith was uh, in Northern Ireland for the Northwest 200. Uh, and a little earlier on, we uh, just about caught up with uh, a special guest. Now, I mentioned right at the start of uh, today's show that Keith is live from the Northwest 200 and uh, he's got a very special guest with him. I'm indeed. Jeremy McWilliams. Thanks for joining us, Jeremy. He's just come through a thunderstorm to get to a... As you can see, we're in salubrious broadcast offices, as usual, that are temporary at all racetracks that we're all used to, but people at home probably won't be. But Jez has just had to work his way through a thunderstorm here, which is typical for the northwest of Ireland, isn't it? Uh, we go from bright sunshine to incredible bad weather. And he's still fast, 59 years old. Jeremy McWilliams, I've got to say, we're all... We're all bloody like this here, we, we have to say. I mean, the guy is still incredibly quick on this nine-mile circuit. But that ain't what we want to talk to you about. We want to talk about Mother GP, Jeremy. <laughs> All right. Which you've been excluded All from. All right, you've okay. Been your We're in the deep end then, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not a red anymore. I, my last race when I was 50 at Miller Road 2 at Silverstone. And uh, actually, to be honest, I felt a little bit out of it back then. That was probably a year or two too old to be taking part in Moto2, but I did it at the request of uh, Mike Trimby at, at Erta because they wanted to be to test a new bike. Anyway, suffice to say, it stopped very quickly after that. Of course, most of us, Jeremy, want to know about what's going on in MotoGP, the, the, the aero situation, the ride height adjustments, all those 
nuances that we seem to have worked into the system now and how that affects tire performance, you know, rider attitude. There's such a, this is such a wide brief for you to go rabbit in on for. Um, we can now say, go Jeremy. And um, the next half hour should be very interesting. I, th- I think it's something that, uh, that that has to be embraced now. You know, there's, there's a uh, quite a divided, uh, you know, uh, opinion on this where people are saying, let's let's get the arrow back off and get it back to how it was. That, to me, can't happen. Speaking with technicians and KTM and people that I know within MotoGP, it's gone too far already. And it's just got to be embraced and carry on with it now. You know, you cannot run a 300-horsepower a motorcycle in a straight line, really, without some kind of aid at the moment. And that's the issue, particularly at somewhere like Mugello. So I was saying, you know, Mugello, that, that hill at Mugello needs some kind of arrow on the front of the bike to keep the front wheel in contact with the floor. And if it wasn't there, they're all going to be wheeling over it. Uh, or are they going to be wheeling and spinning? So arrow at the moment uh, is just going to have to, it's, it's just going to have to be accepted and, and carry on and, all teams will catch up and all teams will get as good as he, as one another out of the more money they spend on it. And let's, let's be honest, what would you be? Money, aero, what, what, what's the difference? It costs that much anyway, you know, you know, KTM are using Red Bull technology at the moment and it seems to be working. So we're embracing F1 technology. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, but I know we can't take aero bag off. KTM seem to have made an absolutely enormous step from testing where, you know, us included, but most of the world, I would suggest, um, thought they were going to be the flop of the year. And from testing to where we are now was remarkable. Did did you guys see that coming? Were you trying stuff in testing that you hadn't, had you already got a default mode before you went testing? And then you've gone back to that. What, what, what's the story? How did, how did it get to the point where we all thought you were going to be a flop? And then all of a sudden your race winning material across other riders, several riders. There's a number of things, uh, you know, that helped that. Obviously, the test team has been instrumental and uh, our test rider, particularly Danny Pedrosa, you know, going on from Mika Kaleo through to Danny. They're, they're obviously awesome test riders, but they just can't produce everything on their own. You know, you you, you can throw stuff at a test rider all day long and he, he, he'll, he'll him and ha between bits and pieces and jump between one or... And, and the next bit, but you won't see huge improvements over over a couple of days testing. I was at a wind tunnel test with the t- with the test team uh, for Arrow, so it's a pretty simple job. You just sit on the motorcycle in a in a hundred and eighty mile an hour wind tunnel all day with earplugs in. Make sure your elbows don't <laughs> don't, don't don't tick out, and they're looking for particular size riders, riders that can fit perfectly behind. And then what they do is they get you to. Uh, comment on on different screens, uh, front nose cone shapes, wings, uh, really everything that goes all the way through the right down to the back of the bike and what it affects the rider when you're sitting in a prone position. And it's quite interesting because you learn quite a lot about about the shapes of the windscreen and the shapes so that they're using at the front and how that does affect the rider. And sometimes the winglets and wings do have an effect on buffeting on the rider. So reason behind it is obviously to reduce that buffeting and then for them to take that data uh, they're they're all they're, they're monitoring it and and watching airflow over the top of the rider uh drag efficiency or coefficiency and 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 then working out what's best then when i was there the red bull uh aero team arrived so they were starting to use those guys from from red bull and Part of the reason maybe that they're improving so much is because their arrow is getting better. Uh, another reason, and let's be honest, is that, uh, you know, Jack Miller's come from Ducati. So when he's come over from Ducati, he's brought, he brought some te- uh, Ducati technology with him. Um, KTM have been employing some Ducati technicians, as we know. And that's that's how it works. Jeremy, it's fascinating to, to hear that. I- I'm also keen to know, you, We t- Keith asked you about, you know, the rate at KTM develops but how do you look at MotoGP in the modern day as well we talk you talk about aero there but also they're fiddling with the the format and the setup we've got the sprint that's come in now how have you looked at that this year we've had a few races now lots of injuries more so perhaps than if we didn't have the sprint how do you feel about it I, I was you know absolutely against it to begin with because I'm I was so happy to see the progression of MotoGP 
carrying on throughout the weekend and how you know the, the you know team strategy were working working towards that that ever fastest lap that they needed for qualification. Now it seems that teams don't have the time to do that. They can't, they can't get there. So not always the same teams that you expect that make better progress are the ones ending up on top, which is really <laughs> actually made the whole format that little bit much more fun to watch on a Saturday. Because I, I guess I guess I thought I was going to miss all of that. But when you throw a sprint race in with hardly any qualifying time or you know teams that are on the back foot with not the, the, the absolute um, perfect setup and then put them into a race situation, it's bloody brilliant. It's fantastic. And I, 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 I just think they should maybe just have a number of sprint races through the, through the the weekend. But the sprint race right now is is pretty awesome to watch because, and particularly for KTM fans or KTM employees like myself, because KTM have worked very very hard on on trying to get that perfect start. And you can see twice in RF, you know that that both Jack and Brad were able to, to get to the front, and that's kind of nearly nearly half the battle right now in, in MotoGP, you know, where we're going to go back and start talking about aero and the difficulties in passing with, because of aero, et cetera. But it it makes determined riders like Jack and Brad absolutely, uh, you know, it, it motivates them no end to be somewhere near the front because they know they can now win a sprint race. Uh, Jack's first time on the podium was KTM. And you know, let's be honest, when we looked at that, I mean, in uh, preseason testing, he, did, he didn't look all of that, uh, you know, special on, on on the bike. But he's adapted to the bike very well, and uh, and all of a sudden, you know, he's 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 now in podium position and put himself in podium positions also for for the main event. So I think the sprint race is good. Uh, I'm sure if you asked all of the teams and riders, you know, they're they're not probably making anything more out of it in terms of monetary gains for, for riders or prize funds or whatever that might be and it puts them under a bit more pressure puts the team under a bit more pressure because the team have to work extra hard but I'm sure that the teams are going to be coming up with something at the end of the season particularly if their guys are on top all the time there's going to be bonuses handed out so let's say let's let's just let's admit it makes awesome TV well it is our producer Adrian who we feel very sorry for. Uh, I'm sure it won't make sense to our to our viewers or listeners because he'll have smoothed this all over. Uh, but Keith has changed changed location and he's now joined Jeremy. Uh, so I will hand back over to Keith uh, and we'll pick up where we left off. Well, I think that the, the 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 big thing for me is how KTM made the improvement that they made from being what looked like going to be a disaster through testing preseason. Suddenly that bike, when we got to the Grand Prix, across all the different shapes and sizes of rider, they made it work the way that they did it, how the improvement came. Now, I wondered whether perhaps in testing, you'd thrown us all a bit of a banana to slip over on when it came to our production and our um, our prediction. Um, then came out with a motorbike that works across lots of different shapes and sizes and different riding styles, you know, as Danny pruned, in the way that he did. I mean... Did KTM know that this was going to be the case? Had they had that that knowledge prior? I think there's 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 all these uh, with everything a phase, a development phase that doesn't happen overnight. You can say it didn't happen overnight with KTM. Beginning of the season it looked like you know that there were areas where that KTM were going to struggle in. But you know you got a test team that's working very very hard behind the scenes with Wolfgang Weber and his guys and. Uh, and as I say, yeah, they make small improvements, and riders like Danny Pedrosa, who are awesome test riders, by the way, are are integral of that part of that whole team. And really, give the correct feedback when we're going the right way and what's going the wrong way, same thing. But that only gets it so far, Keith. You know, there's other factors that have to come into it, and you know, I was in the wind tall saying you're up with them about end of last year. Uh, Trying different screens, different different wings, etc. How it affects the buffeting on the on the rider, how stable it, it keeps the rider in position. All of those things that you do it with a you know hundred eighty per hour wind tunnel. Down it. But at the same time, Red Bull technology were there. You know, their F one technology, so their aero technology, which brings a, a huge amount of experience 
into KTM. And you can see some of that was paying off or F some new parts on the bike that we haven't seen before. But it's not just that. It's other things like bringing Jack Miller into the team, bringing what he learned with Ducati, bringing some Ducati engineers into the team. We know we've done that. Every team does it. You know, good technicians do get snapped up by other teams. And the reason why is not because they need more people. They need the right people. So people, you know, our guys do get replaced whenever there's an availability of, of a Ducati engineer or whoever that might be, or for the engineer, then they're going to snap them up. That's what happens. So let, let's be honest. It's, it's been a, you know, a kind of a, a mix of, of all these things. Also, the thinking was broader from, from, from by Mullen. And sorry if I'm repeating this, but the um, internet breakup that we've had a moment ago. But Danny Pajosa, particularly, wasn't really that wanted by HRC, by Honda. Um, and he was almost like a giveaway to KTM. They didn't value him in the way that KTM did. Whether that had something to do with Mike Leidner originally, who is and was at KTM at that time. You know, Danny came on board and it. It comes back to down to the fact they built a motorcycle like the M1 Yamaha used to be, where everybody could ride it pretty well. ATM seems now across all these different rider platforms, rider ideas, rider input, they've made a bike that works for all these different. You're, you're absolutely there, right? There, you know, Mike Leiter would have had something to do with, with Dan Pedrosa to come in because he worked with them for so long and he obviously rated them very, very highly. You know, for whatever reason, the HRC didn't reckon they needed Danny as a test driver. I'll never know why why they would let him go because it's been so good for for KTM and it continues to be. And then when you see what he's capable of doing at her F, you know, right in since two thousand eighteen, it's absolutely incredible. You can finish the top six. But also, if you remember, Francesco Guidotti, you know, came away from Ducati and joined KTM as a team manager. He used to work with me many many years ago. Very, very, very clever guy too. Uh, and he also rated Jack Miller. He, you know, he continued to rate Jack Miller whenever Ducati thought that Jack was kind of washed up and time to replace him. I think Ducati's loss was KTM's gain. And, you know, so, so those those factors, you know, even having people in, the, in your team that, that, that you worked with before and won't get back again and believe in you also gives the rider like a second cap wind, you know, big motivation to be uh, that, like charged with the KTM. They have a kind of winning philosophy of KTM. They're quite ruthless from where, from looking outside, looking in. It, it always appears to me at MTM that they are prepared to make steps. I think of the Zarco situation when Zarco said it wasn't quite for me. Um, he gave them a, a, a bit of notice of the fact he was going to leave them at the end of the year and they said, Okay, bye. Yeah. <laughs> See ya. And he was he was fired out of there straight away. I mean, they they seem to be people that, that they want that hundred percent, hundred and ten percent dedication to the tool or not. Motorsports uh, probably the most difficult department to work within in KTM. You know, and I've been tempted a couple of times by Fabo to go and well, I mean, I've worked with in the past. Uh, he works with Kurt Treeb and all the gentlemen. And brothers, and there's, he's kind of been trying to. Tease me in, I've always thought, you know, it's it looks like a such a, a you know, it, it is a, a lion's den in there. You know, you you you've got to be able to pull your weight. You've got to be able to do what you're, you you've set your your target on going in to do, or else don't don't even bother. I've got such a good job with my R&D department and with some marketing stuff that I go to. The, I'm quite happy just watching the motorsport department from the outside and doing all my day to day job because I know I've got a three year contract with them. You 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 never get a three year contract with a motorsport department. And you might get a one year out of it if if it goes well and the right kid and you you know, you've you've done what you've end up to do it there and then they keep it for another year. There's no guarantees but and that's just the way it is. But the personnel in all the motorsports department, not KTM, Ducati, on the Yamaha, wherever it might be, they're all changing hands quite quickly. Do they poach? Do they actively you look? All the other teams, and you mentioned good after earlier on, he's got good experience with, with so many different people and, and teams. Do they, do they actually look to see if there's a weakness? Is there a situation behind the bike ship where they're fiddling up different personnel around the paddock? Obviously, illegally, they're not supposed to, and everyone's under, under non disclosure orders and God knows what in their contract. But is there a little bit of that 
I won't say KTM, let's say generally. Is there a little bit of that going on around the trucks all the time? Yes, you can. I won't even go on, Steve. I, I guess that is, you're right. We, you know, there's reasons for employing and coaching managers like come back. Because obviously he's got a talent. He's Italian. Yeah, well, he's got thanks for the Ducati. He's worked with Ducati for many, many years. So he knows that maybe some technicians that are that are, that are not working any longer or move to a different team or not happy or whatever they might be, he can go and say, look, it's not truly over here, you know, next year. It's not going to take him there and then. He's going to wait the years out. And then they're going to say, okay, we have an option for you. Maybe in the year 2023, when it was 21, when he we were back, KTM when 20. 21 was that and you can see that some of those guys that trust them and believe in them you know have come over and that's that's how it works you, you're going to have a, a very very high level of trust in, in that guy for him to be able to coach or, or ask him to come over when they're finished up with public joy with i can't see him doing i mean I may be wrong here but i'll ask you because you know better than me because you've been to the factories and you know how it all works from, from that perspective but they are a small organization, really, as an overall producer of goods, if you like, compared with surely with the likes of Suzuki on the Yamaha. I mean, surely those are, they, they must surely shift more units than, than maybe KTM do. We know they're massive in off road, so therefore there must be a bit of profit in that. But how does a relatively small, what we consider to be a relatively small battery, put all those resources into a situation where for instance, Suzuki had to pile out because they basically didn't have enough money to continue. So how does how does KTM find that amount of cash to actually achieve that? Well, first day, you know, I was with them not so long ago when we first year that we we earned over a billion billion euros and that's now double. So they're actually the biggest European um Producer, so above Ducati, above yeah. all the other pre yeah. Agio and all that lot. Well, you, when you put it all all together, you know all of their off road stuff and everything. I think they're they're, they're not the biggest sure just so of on motorcycles. So obviously that's all to do with but a lot of it's to do with with the right sponsorship and they have the right sponsorship in place. And now that that sponsorship's paying off, you know, you heard the rumors. Okay, you know they're not going to hang around forever waiting for a result. But right now. I'm sure Red Bull is happier than they've ever been with any team at the moment because of what KGM are doing and what Red Bull are doing with them. And it's, it, it, it looks at, and it always was a match made in heaven. It's been, you know, there for many, many years. It's two Austrian companies side by side and it, and it just fits, it fits very, very, very well. So, uh, let, let's be honest, you know, that a lot of it really hinges on that, on that, that sponsorship. I mean, I can't. It's got to be the biggest market in the world still for motorcycles because if you're off road by the time. I mean, that ATM make it happy packers. And top five years, you know. <laughs> but they've got a huge share of the market over there, as you know. And, you know, they look at their world titles, you can understand why. Um, and they continue to, to to succeed everywhere and in every every discipline that they, that they step into. Where's the next gap then for KTM racing, as in road racing, as in Grand Prix racing? Where do we, um, is, is there the direction I'm aiming at? Well, yeah, when they've achieved all they set out to achieve to be a GP World Champions, which you can't say, with the way they're going at the moment, this year could be the year even. I mean, we don't even need to look next year. Um, they must have an ultimate goal at the end of the day to be a GP World Champions. What's next? I think everything hinges on that at the moment. Uh, in the future, you know, it'll be it, it, again. There's a at the moment we're probably bringing another department, opening a department again that also helps bring in more customers on onto the track. And yeah, we I just come from an RC at Sea launch, which was pretty awesome. So track bike only, one of the only manufacturers making track bikes only at the minute and, and selling exclusively, you know, with in limited numbers. And that seems to be quite a successful part of what they're doing right now. I think that's going to get bigger and bigger. So we can only hope that again, those smaller classes, you know, start up may not have just come from India where we were to our C390 Cup, where they had a thousand participants taking place in a hundred, actually, yeah, a hundred cities, 
over about six or seven months and they whittled it right down to uh, 80 participants taking part in the very, very last one, all on KTM3 or C390s. And three, the three winners from that, there's three, three top riders from that, like I'm over to Austria, get to ride on track with us. That is a Red Bull ring. Lots, so lots of nice little things like, like that happen in the, in the background uh, that KTM are, are there supporting. And I think that will carry on. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get to see them going back in to a little stronger, maybe in towards Sport 300. Um, you know, in the future on something that we're working on that we want to be in 600 super sport. So there's, they are putting their toe back into the water in other classes again. That's a couple of years down the line, but at least we can see that the, you know, things are in place at the moment to make that happen. I had to rib you about your age as soon as you come on, and that obviously is jealous. <laughs> because she was still playing football, well, was still an athlete, whereas I'm not there being comparison. But you ever have trouble kind of keeping up with the pace of technology and the piece of the way things are done behind the scenes? It's quite a daunting uh, area now, isn't it? Technology. I'd love to be able to tell you. I'll tell you when we start recording. But <laughs> it's, I mean, it blew my mind away. It's, it's breaking technology. Which which we will use uh, very very soon. Are you scared by it? Does it does it kind of? I remember my old dad talking about mobile phones when they first came into you know like and you all got a mobile phone. He was blown away by the fact you could use mobile. Phone. Is it that kind of groundbreak? We're moving at such a pace, aren't we? Forwards, it's exponential. We just keep rolling forward with more and greater ideas. In fact, that brought it out. Let me ask you: Is the Mobile GP rulebook too thin to cope with? The kind of technology and the kind of people that are now pushing. Very good point. Yeah, you know, and it could be. And um, you know, the I mean, but wait, look, it, I think we have to look at Ducati as the leaders of innovations. You look at GT, those guys that have that have brought all of this firstly, and then other teams copy it. You know, who knows what's around the corner? Um, has GT run out of ideas yet? But you know, we've also got engineers on there at the moment. It's with one last week and you know they've got some really good ideas for the future as well that seem to me like it's going to take it up a level because we kind of thought that well we've got to be there oh it's 300 horsepower or close to 300 horsepower how much more can it go but talking to these engineers already they're thinking about the next step and, and how to get how to move that up you move us on to another question then don't you I mean already we're looking at racetracks so we're getting a bit tight to speak of these bikes and the fact that now you can get in and out corners and with aero and the like, and ground effects that it's trying as well. That you know now that the things can sit or they're now sucking it to the ground with a bit of ground effect aero as well. It's all gone a little bit mad, but what that does is then become a cost war. You know, it's who can finance the the development as fast as the next man. That must be surely a problem, even for a well-funded team like Ace Net. Probably more of a problem for. You know, teams that are left behind, you know, how do we catch up? How is Honda ever going to catch up? You know, it's European manufacturers that are leading the World Championship. I don't know when you ever heard us take that. It'd be quite a few years since you didn't see a Japanese manufacturer right at the forefront. So, you know, you know it looks more a little bit like, like the Japanese manufacturer are getting left behind because this this technology or in, in, innovations or that are happening seem to be happening in Europe. Um, and I guess... As you just quite rightly said, it has to be happening in Europe because most of all of the Formula One stuff is based in Europe. So anything they're learning from, they're learning from for Formula One. But you know, back to that first question: as those bikes produce more and more power, there's no way that we could take that arrow away, Keith. That's good. That's here forever. I think there just has to be a minimum level that teams can get to. They're going to have to step up a little bit, and the teams that are going to have to step up. Yamaha Honda. So what we must have then at some stage, because again, I can't get away from the safety of the track, on the classic tracks, more in the track, but they're going to find themselves in barriers, being a little bit by getting by three to barriers now, which we haven't had that much in a long time. Uh, do we end up with backing when the tires are then regulated into a certain shape or style? Bring us on to the tire pressure thing. I think we'll ignore. Do we ignore tire pressures as a, as an overall thing to talk about? 
much more interesting talking about where they're going to restrict motorbikes from going. Yeah, we're dealing 220 mile an hour in a lot of places now. We're going to be 250 mile an hour. I remember factory bikes, if they reached 160 miles an hour back in the day, that was groundbreakingly fast. And we are now 60 mile an hour faster than that with ease in certain places. Um, where does the safety angle of it come? Because as responsible promoters of Respondent Order have got to find a way restricting how dangerous a racetrack is going to be in the future. Yeah, that's absolutely it. The next talking point, now, unfortunately, what I would hate to happen is that, you know, Dorn will go, we can't do that with the racetrack. So we're going to make a 600cc maximum or something, or 800cc maximum again, which we know didn't work in the past. It, it, it kind of messed the whole thing up. Just put it on the back foot for two or three years and then mm-hmm. they had to revert back to what it was. So I say, you know, look at what happened to Paul, for instance, at Point I am or Chido. Yeah. It, it, that is the nature of that circuit because the circuit it gets light into that turn and you're you're actually relying on some some downforce effect at that time to get into that turn as quickly as the guys are getting into it right on you know when Bagnaya lost the front and said he, he wasn't doing anything wrong it's just because the arrow pushes the tire for so long and squeezes the tire further more so than it ever did before but at some stage you can only squeeze it for so long before before let's go and the only thing that Dora can do right now is to change some parts of the track go and highlight those areas that need address and that would be that last turn at Port of Mayo, for instance it would be it but we if we sat and talked about it you know it's it, there's quite a few it's turn four around it's it's, it's turn 11 12 and 11 those two short places do you think it's going to sustain you not the elite but this, and, and in my own personal opinion, I mean, do you, I, do you agree with that? Um, ben, you do you think that going down a sustainable fuel route is going to slow things up a little bit anyway, naturally? I don't think it is, no. Um, when you've got companies like Porsche that are, that are pouring millions into this, this type of fuel technology, it's only because they don't want to lose any performance. So I guess that the new fuel may even be better than the, than the fossil fuel that we're using. <laughs> I'm... I've never been this close to Jeremy, even though he's been a breath of mine for many, many years. So, <laughs> we've never had race together, so I've never been on the same grid this close. Either. Because I'm too young. <laughs> I can kind of move a little bit back this way. No, big rather than get stuck. I, I definitely, especially as Jeremy, of course, as you say, Keith, is still racing now. Jeremy, penalties are a big talking point at the moment. Now, I think Paul Butler was the race director when you were in Grand Prix, and he had that famous interview where he said, motorcycle racing is a contact sport, which caused a bit of an uproar. I'd just be interested to know what your opinion is on that and on, on the penalties that we've seen recently. Well, my view, and not just my own view, but lots of ex racers and guys that I spoke to, but the view, our view was that there should not have been any penalties had about or F whatsoever. Uh, it, you know, the, there was, there was gaps. You go for gaps. If you don't go for a gap, well, you're not racing. If there's contact and it's, and it's rushing, like Paul said, touching or contact, it's acceptable. We accept to come in with rubber marks on our arms or on our legs or on our water bikes. That's, that's part of the sport. Yeah. You don't expect to be T-boned. And then that deserves a, an obvious penalty and quite a severe penalty. But everything that happened down to the Fabio thing, you know, when Fabio was trying to slow up and basically the gap's closing, can't give a rider a penalty for trying to avoid an accident. You know, you can't give a rider a penalty for trying to race because they're they're penalizing riders for attempting to race one another. And I that I'll be just upfront about this that the that's those stewards that are making those decisions need to be replaced right now. There's no other way about it because they want to keep doing the same thing. And until somebody takes action, I don't know what's going to be the riders, the riders' managers, or whatever it might be, they get together and say, guys, we can't accept this any longer. And if I was in the middle of that, I'd be the first person to put my head up saying, let me go and put this to up, across to the race direction because the, it kind of carried on. Wasn't that a situation now? Excuse me again, but you can butt in any of it. Wasn't it a situation though, with the, the Friday night you know, rider safety briefing? Which would be that no one ever bothered to turn up to. 
And also, work your odd this year. There were a lot of riders that were stamping their feet saying the penalties must be stronger for this kind of, but for a slightly stronger party. It seems almost like cake and eat it situation for a rider. I mean, we discussed this in the last podcast and I ran into the way like an idiot in some incoherent way. <laughs> and I looked at my own podcast after for you guys and I remember thinking, what the hell was that? As a rider, I'd with you, but as a modern day sport, Penalties are now here to stay for so many things that we, as a, as our, you know, my generation, particularly yours, was next up. But we don't like penalties. We like a bit of rub in his racing. You've got people like Aleish, for instance. Yeah. who is a guy who will scream from the rooftops as soon as you rub him up the wrong way, quite literally. And that conflict seems to have come out in decisions made by Freddie Spencer and the other two blokes, whoever they are, that make the decision. Well, you have the tick, tick jokes. Uh, never all that uh, but uh, the hope we had it got uh go by now I got a a penalty for for diving over the jacket turn six in our rep and he just brushed him. You know, yeah, it should never have been a penalty. Brushed him but but in you know, and this is what's gonna happen, it's it's turning into a bit of a football scenario. So if Jack makes such a big thing about it and and demonstrates, you know, or demonstrates that that that, that he shouldn't have done that. Well, then, you know, there's a jerk, a jerk reaction from the stewards, and the stewards like, "Oh, oh, look, Jack's been hurt, or he's been hit, or boom. Well, okay, let's quick, let's get him up." So, it, you know, it's going to turn into a football oh. field. They're going to start rolling around the floor, and basically oh. holding their idols and saying, "I thought." Head of a, I was told that it was the differential between that and made that or hey Martin that thing was because he did brush it. So if you pick up and you don't touch, you don't get a penalty. But if you stick to your line and you brush, you get a penalty for it. No, a not um, brushing the some you know corners. That there's always going to be that. I mean, there's times where we touch elbows quite a lot, like it's loses. Well, right, because you push it out because you want them off. You, yeah, you lift it yeah. off. Yeah, and, and and you do. And sometimes it, it, you need to, or, or else he keeps closing all the bike and then actually you break Lee had or whatever. Right. So so there, there there are necessities for brushing sometimes. And uh, I think if you take everything as a okay, touched him or whatever it might be, you know. Next thing we're going to have sensors and the leathers are on the bikes, and there's even one brush against the other. Oh, it's gone off with the hair. Oh, he needs a penalty. So I, I'm obviously you can tell that what I'm, I'm saying here. I'm completely against it, but I'm I am still supportive of the penalties that require to be handed out whenever it's severe enough, particularly when riders are riding hard into each other. For instance, uh. It looked a little bit like that in Superbike at the weekend, you know, that, that, that it was a tit for tat. Yeah. Move. Bassani, Bassani, Bassani into, into, they've been ready out of the ring. I think, I think we're looking at two people that could sit quite nicely in the stewarding room uh, over Grand Prix weekends and uh, have a little <laughs> decide as to <laughs> what's yeah, the penalty and what's not. There's about a fight of yeah. me. <laughs> oh, you know how to play brilliant. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't, don't worry. <laughs> Um, look, we, we we are running out of time, so I've got Pete, Keith, final questions to Jeremy. Um, we, you mentioned uh, Fabio, Jeremy, and I'd just be interested. We see him on the Yamaha. He's struggling with his sort of corner speed. He's getting blocked by the V4s. Uh, sometimes a bit, a bit of a thing you had with the Proton. Sometimes you'd be quick in the corners and the other bikes would hold you up. But what do you make of Fabio's situation? He's, what, 11th in the World Championship. He seems like he's a bit unhappy out. Know? How hard do you think it is for him at it's, the moment? It, it looks like it's, it isn't the only possible, doesn't it? And uh, he's riding the wheels of it. And if you look at his lap times, if you took the double lap, long lap penalty out of it, he, he, he still was able, he's able to to produce the lap times. But as you say, not maybe as easily in in, in race situation because you know of of the Yamaha's slight weaknesses compared to the other bikes. And the best thing that that Fabio could do right now, I mean. The one thing that we don't want to be doing is losing a talent such as Fabio. And if you're a Fabio's manager right now, and I'm not sure if he's got the right manager or not, to be honest, but if if you had the right manager, he'd be up knocking on all of the European doors, trying to get Fabio the next seat in there, because that's, that's where he deserves to be. And, and unfortunately, yeah, they're... So Carl's doing a great job with the Yamaha. They've got the Yamaha as good as it's been. 
but unfortunately the factory aren't really producing the bike that's it's going to be able to fight for a championship in the next couple of years and at, at that and in those scenarios pete you know the the only one thing that the rider can do is start to look for a new position and not you know, stay with the manufacturer because they've been good to him for a number of years. You know, you, you can become a little bit sort of stuck in your ways. And I think you have to take that step and step outside your comfort zone and move on to something else. And it's the same with Mark Marquez. Until we see Mark Marquez on something else, he is the best thing out there, but everybody's catching up. And riders like Brad Bender at the moment are riding like Mark Bart Marquez. And, you know, Peco's as fast as Mark's ever been anywhere on anything. But wouldn't we love to see Mark Marquez on anything but a Honda right now? And I think that's the next thing, too. If we saw Fabio Marquez on European bikes, wow. It would be, I'd, I would be glued to the screen because that would be awesome. Can I expand that out a bit, Pete? Are we in a situation where maybe we lose someone like Yamaha to the series? As we did with Suzuki. You know, you've got at least a two or three year catch up time. Yeah, and that's if they throw the kitchen sink at it, and make it work like KTM have, like Aprilia have, um, and like Honda have got to be yeah. able to work. Could we lose another manufacturer? I think if you lose two, I think Honda are going to realize quite quickly that, you know, the reason why they've been successful is because of Mark. You know, Honda will never, never agree to that, as we know in the past with Valentino, but. The reason why Honda being successful is only because of Mark Marquez. And once Mark Marquez starts to lose kind of trust in the brand and he moves, you know, there's every reason that, that Honda wouldn't hang about because of, you know, the poor money into a series with not a very, very top, top rider able to put you. So there's a chance that you could use those one or two more manufacturers over the next couple of years, which would be a terrible thing, except that. The European manufacturers seem to be able to produce more bikes than the Japanese were ever able to do. An scenario, one that we really didn't, um, well, shouldn't entertain, really. I can't imagine not having Yamaha. I couldn't imagine having Suzuki. Suzuki called it all the hard work. It could have motivated. We did Grand Prix. It won the last two Grand Prix, didn't it? And, well, like, anyway, another story. Just a question. But, Um, well, yeah, it's, it, I'm, I'm just still worried about the, yeah, losing two more manufacturers. I mean, let's, let's hope that doesn't happen, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's depressing, on the isn't it? Yeah. Side, <laughs> yeah. On the, on the positive side, as you say, the Europeans and Aprilia, who of course you, you race for, uh, Jeremy during your time. I mean, to see those guys recently, their, their climb up, I mean, has been quite spectacular because they were, they were at the back for a long time, weren't they? But, uh, they've done it and they've done it without Gigi, as you say, Gigi had already moved to Ducati. And uh, they look like they've got a pretty decent bike now. They have, yeah. And, you know, well, a pretty good always branded as someone else by another, by another mark and branded as someone else as well, you know, as KTM have done with Gas Gas. You know, we'll, as soon we'll be seeing an MV Augusta back on the, on the big red, I'm sure. Um, but, yeah, they, they, they pretty have kind of blown me away just how, how, how quickly and successfully they've moved from being an also round to, you know, a championship contender. Um like KTM, like KTM, yeah. But, yeah. Well, you know, and like and like Ducati, yeah. but for sure, can you imagine Marquez or even are we on one of those Aprilias as well? I mean, that would be the, the the battle would just get bigger, and you know, I I I, I hope that's the case, and we you know, we don't lose a couple of decent riders or even as you say, two two more manufacturers. That would be terrible. But the future is bright in Europe at the minute. Mr. Sam Duncan, yeah, from the UK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let, yeah, let's uh, let's let's Speaking end there on a, on a positive, a more positive note than uh, than the fact of uh, we might lose way more manufacturers. Let's not talk about that. Um, look, thank you so much, Jeremy Williams, for for taking the time out and for dealing with the technical and Wi-Fi issues. Uh, so thank you uh, for that. Um, best of luck as well for for the rest of your Northwest 200 as well. We'll all be back in your and, and uh, giving you positive thoughts ahead of this uh, week onwards um thank you jeremy for coming on the crash motor gp podcast thank you. and human fired miserably i'm terribly sorry about that fox was very good to tell <laughs> we got there in the end we managed to get there keith at about five different locations but we did get there in the end i mean fascinating keith to hear from jeremy though nonetheless what did you what were the key takeaways from from that chat did you take 
uh, Jeremy will be in trouble for saying as much as he said, effectively. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, he's a he's a lovely guy, Jeremy Williams. I mean, he, he, he is straightforward, and he's a, he's patience of a saint. <laughs> well, he is. He has got the patience of a saint, but he genuinely he hasn't. Um, because we are still recording this podcast at this moment in time, and I'm supposed to be buying him beer and his wife's yeah. beer <laughs> down the road, he's going to be saying that I dodged buying the beer again. Well, I think that the, the takeaway is that KTM have really worked really, really hard and continue to do so, and they've got more innovations in the pipe, which must be absolutely scary for just about every other manufacturer, but particularly for the Japanese manufacturers. You know, with Ducati doing what they're doing, with KTM now on it, Aprilia are on it as well. You know, the Europeans are coming. I, I don't... There's never been a time like this, I don't think. And this should go back to Norton and Triumph whenever it was in, in the dark and black and white days. Um, it is remarkable, isn't it, what's, what's, what they have achieved. In, when you think about the testing, we were all watching the testing quite closely. And they were nowhere. We could not see KTM. They obviously could see themselves being where they wanted to be, but it didn't show publicly. So good on them. Big clap to um, KTM for what they're achieving. And and a frightening, eye-opening conversation with Jeremy McWilliams that gives us a bit of a clue as to um, the fact that KTM are nowhere near topped out when it comes to ideas and innovation. Yeah, well, it is what we like to hear, but we want to hear that from every every manufacturer on the grid as well. But uh, thank you again, thanks again, Jeremy, for taking the time. Now, Keith's got to buy them a beer, so we've uh, better wrap this thing up with our predictions and then get the hell out of here. So, are we ready, folks? Let's start with your sprint. I'll buy you some time. I'll go first. I'm going for a Miller win in the sprint, followed, we talk up KTM, there we go, followed by a Peko Banyaya. And an Alicia Spargro to steal a third place. That's my podium. I'll tell you Pete? what, that's, that's a oh, good Keith, one. Who's who's going first? Gone? Pete, you go first, Pete. Um, it's a, it's, that's, a, that's a good call. Yeah, I think as I think Keith was saying there, yeah. Uh, you know what? I'm I've hedged go, my bets. I'm going to go Binder for the win. Ah, yep. uh, so, okay. Banya is second. And I'm going to go Miller third. I just think that Alicia is going to have Double the, same, KTM. the same passing problems he had ever is. I think that's that's good, good, good holding back. But there we go. Let's see. God. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Mimmer Williams. <laughs> He's not in MotoGP anymore, Keith. I can't have him. <laughs> okay. Well, no, you, you guys old, but... have, have, have gone for... I'm... I'd love to go for Alish in... Um... Bagnaia, Elish, and the D- D- Cotterara. Okay, you're going to have Fabio on there. All right, then. Okay, that's the sprint. Grand Prix, back to me. Bagnaia for the win. And then I'm going double KTM. Binder, Miller, second and third. Back to you, Pete. I'm going to go Miller for his first win on the KTM in a, in a oh, Grand Prix, if we okay. assume whatever happens in the sprint. Uh, and I'll go Bagnaia, Binder. Uh, I'll, I'll flip the order. <laughs> Keith. Ouch. You're going to go Zarco. Well, I'm trying. Uh, I'm trying to Fabio. I'm trying to think my way around this at the moment, and I'm, 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 the weather forecast seems okay. If it was wet, then it would be easier for me. But I'm, I'm going to mm. go. Oh damn! Bang has for a win. Binder for second place. Zarco for third. Okay. A home, a home podium for Joanne Zarko. I could get behind that, but um, I'm not going to put him on there. Right, predictions <laughs> locked in. Gonna, Let us know. I think I'm going to lose some points this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Me and Keith and I are tied at the moment. It's Pete that needs to make up ground. So, you know, there's a little bit of legway there. Um, right, let's end things there then. Thank you very much uh, for... Uh, joining us as always make sure you're tuned in across crash.net for all the latest news and analysis across the week in the build-up and across of course the uh, the french grand prix at le mans uh, we will be back with you next week get your questions in leave them in the comments section or tweet instagram facebook us just search crash moto gp the email is podcast at crash.net thank you jeremy mcwilliams please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and we shall see you right back here next week but from myself harry benjamin from pete mclaren and keith hewin bye-bye